the title suggests, in this presentation, I'm going to be talking about a new approach to educational assessment, one that involves standardized assessments that support real learning. I'll start by defining and making a case for what we call real learning. And then I'll explore what this means for assessment and go on to describe the assessments we build here at Lectica, disco tests. How they support real learning. Then finally, I'm going to show an example of how they can be used in practice. One last thing. You should know that Lectica is a nonprofit and that our mission is to deliver all of our learning tools free of charge to individual teachers everywhere. We exist only to serve learning. Here's an example of real learning. 15 minutes ago, each of these kids was handed a micro bungee and their teacher put an extra bungee and a cup in the middle of the circle. Then she explained that the students were to work together to pick up the cup without actually touching it. The kids needed a little help from the teacher to come up with the idea of making a circle out of the extra bungee but they quickly figured out that they could hold the circle open by attaching their bungees to it at different points and pulling a little to hold the circle open. It took a while for them to figure out how hard to pull to make a ring the right size and shape. And now they're cooperating to move the opening over the cup. Their eyes are locked on the circle as they move it into place and every child is experiencing a rush of adrenaline as they approach their goal. This is a lesson in creative thinking, cooperation, and elasticity. The learning is cognitive, kinesthetic, and emotional. I'm going to be arguing that it's the kind of learning experience that builds richly connected knowledge networks and the everyday real world skills children will need to thrive in the 21st century. This kind of activity connects new knowledge with existing knowledge in a way that creates many connections between parts of the brain that perform different functions. This picture is a picture of the connectome and it shows how different regions in the brain are connected with one another. Participants in activities like this are not only actively learning about things like elasticity and cooperation, their unconscious brains are busily making connections between their present experience and other similar experiences. The activity also triggers emotions that strengthen these connections while reinforcing students' experience of learning as engaging, exciting, and pleasurable. And when people learn like this and connect their brains in this rich way, they're more likely to perform better on a wide range of tasks. And when teachers end the lesson we've just been talking about by asking students to unpack their experience with follow-up reflections on cooperation and stretchiness and send each of them home with a handful of bungees or rubber bands and a cup so they can show the activity to family and friends, they're adding the last two ingredients in what we call a recipe for real learning. It's actually what we call robust embodied learning. Contrast this kind of learning with what's happening in most classrooms today, where the kind of activity we just examined takes a back seat to memorizing facts, vocabulary, definitions, rules, and procedures. I'm going to call this kind of learning shallow because much of what is learned is only learned as well as it needs to be learned to pass the test. Even when schools attempt to get beyond the facts to teach fundamental skills, they still tend to focus more on teaching concepts and rules than on developing the skills themselves. In this example from a fifth grade critical thinking lesson plan, students are being taught terminology and definitions. The required skill is memorization, which contributes very little to the actual practice of critical thinking. Critical thinking is turned into a set of definitions and rules rather than being an embodied practice. This is shallow learning, and it's often only sticky enough to last until the test. I have often wondered why this has become acceptable. Isn't it really an outrageous waste of learning time? 
And that's not the only problem with shallow learning. There are big costs associated with privileging shallow learning when it comes to thinking skills, including many failures to rise to the decision-making and problem-solving challenges of our time. Worse, assessment data from over 6,000 primarily low SES public school students in dozens of East Coast schools shows that the growth of the average student's critical thinking skills stalls at around grade 10. By the way, the, the scale we're using to measure growth here is called the lectical scale, which I'll be explaining a bit more later. For now, it's enough to note that an important kind of growth stalls before the average student graduates from high school. Teachers tend to foster shallow learning when tests used to evaluate student progress reward shallow learning. Most standardized tests ask primarily if students recognize which fact, term, rule, definition, or procedure is the right one to use in some well-structured context. When tests reward shallow learning, where's the impetus to foster robust learning supposed to come from? We think the answer lies in alternate forms of assessment that measure and support robust learning. Before I go on to describe our assessments and how they approach this issue, I want to introduce you to the learning model that's behind them. Let's start by taking a closer look at what it takes to foster robust learning. As noted above, this kind of learning is best supported with repeated cycles of practice and reflective activity. This means raising questions about what we observe or experience, drawing tentative conclusions based on our reflections, and applying what we've learned in some way which leads to even more questions, starting the cycle again. This kind of learning is incremental in that each new skill or idea we learn is built upon skills and ideas we already have. When we learn naturally, as when we learn to walk, we automatically set goals for ourselves that are incremental. We don't go from crawling to walking in one step. We build the skill over time with practice, experimentation, and support from others using the feedback from dozens of trials to continuously recalibrate our goals. As each new layer of knowledge is woven into our existing knowledge network, we're constructing a base for the next layer. There's a reason we never forget how to walk. We learn the skill robustly. But when we don't learn robustly, when we repeatedly only get as far as memorizing, then forget much of what we've learned, we create a shaky foundation for future learning, and that will eventually lead to what we've been observing in those inner city public schools. Growth eventually stalls because there's nothing to build on. As a side note, back in 2002, a group of ninth grade science teachers we were working with in Springfield, Massachusetts, complained that it's as if students coming into grade nine have never studied science before. They remember almost nothing. We didn't know then, but the teachers had hit the nail on the head. On a positive note, we've also found that some schools do a lot better than others. The seniors in the very best schools in our sample are a full six to seven years ahead of the seniors in the worst schools, even though the difference in grade one is only about six months. And they're three years ahead of students in high SES public and private schools in our sample so far. Although many factors are clearly in play here, we think much of the difference between these schools lies in how much robust embodied learning is taking place. By the way, I know that for many people, this trend is counterintuitive. The best performing schools spend a lot less time teaching the very things we've come to think of as evidence of learning, those facts, rules, terms, definitions, and procedures targeted in conventional tests. Yet the students in our best performing schools perform just as well on state tests as more conventional private and high SES public schools. Their students just have better skills for thinking and learning, and they're on a steeper growth trajectory. Another important factor in this story is that high quality learning isn't possible unless we set the right learning goals. This means that what students are expected to learn should be just difficult enough to be challenging, 
but not so difficult that failure is inevitable. There are two reasons why this is important. First, and most obviously, if learning goals are set too high, we can't make robust connections. Second, it's when a goal is just right that we're more likely to have fun learning and be motivated to learn more. This is because when goals are just right, our learning efforts produce success just often enough to ensure the release of pleasure hormones called opioids that give us a sense of satisfaction. And these opioids have a second effect. They trigger the release of dopamine, the striving hormone, which motivates us to set another learning goal so we can experience the satisfaction of success once again. We call the zone in which the learning challenge is just right the Goldilocks zone, and the dopamine opioid cycle will repeat indefinitely as long as enough of our learning challenges are in the zone. Clearly, setting learning goals that are just right for a particular learner at a particular point in time is critical for robust learning, and it's one of the main reasons the right kind of tests are so important. They help teachers and students identify the Goldilocks zone. Many learning scientists and teachers have discovered learning cycles like the ones I've been describing, and they've been given many names. At Lectica, we've bundled them up in a simple model we call the Virtuous Cycle of Learning, or VCall. VCall is a cycle of goal-setting, information-seeking, application, and reflection that helps people learn robustly in a way that builds the connectome, or in other words, helps make knowledge and skills usable and sticky while helping learners retain or even rekindle their inborn passion for learning. Here are just a few approaches to learning that involve the application of vCalls. These were all developed during the 20th century. If you're looking for vCalling ideas, all of the models here are both interesting and useful. By the way, vCall is accompanied by seven essential skills, including reflectivity, awareness, seeking and evaluating information, making connections, applying knowledge, both verbally and experientially, seeking and working with feedback, and recognizing and overcoming built-in biases. While vCall itself is simple to learn and apply, learning to build the plus seven skills involves a bit of a learning curve. What does vCall plus seven have to do with assessment? From our perspective, everything. We think the primary justification for any educational assessment is the role it plays in supporting high-quality learning. Let's look at how these three different kinds of assessments, what we're calling conventional, formative, and disco tests, measure up along several dimensions on the left-hand side here, including the kinds of skills they target, the targeted constructs, the thing that is being tested, the item types, the answer type that's required, the kind of metrics that are being used, the purpose of the assessments, and whether or not the assessments are standardized. So in the case of conventional assessments, the skills are memorizing facts, terms, rules, definitions, and procedures, primarily, not exclusively anymore, but primarily. The targets are recognizing which fact, term, rule, definition, or procedure is the right one to use in a specific, well-structured context. The item types are mostly multiple choice, with some open response these days. But the answer type is still pretty much right or wrong, whether the items are multiple choice or not. The metrics themselves are psychometrically determined. They're arbitrarily determined scales based upon student performance. And the purpose of the assessments has been primarily selection and ranking. And yes, they are standardized. Formative assessments often do a better job supporting robust learning, but their effectiveness hinges on several factors. In terms of skills, the skills that are targeted tend to be varied. Some people use formative assessments to measure the same kinds of skills measured in conventional tests, but sometimes the skills being measured are actually more vCall friendly. And in terms of targets, we have the same issue. 
the targets are also varied. Sometimes they're similar to those targeted in conventional tests. And other times, again, they're more vCall friendly. Item types, on the other hand, are more likely to be open response and less likely to be multiple choice when it comes to formative assessments. And the answer type's different too. Rather than focusing on right or wrong responses, we're more likely to be focusing on better or worse responses. The metrics tend to be rubrics, and these can either be created by teachers or test developers. But either way, they're actually being used by teachers. And the purpose of these assessments is to be formative, to support learning. So that's different from the selection and ranking purpose of conventional assessments. But in terms of the way that they're scored, we can't say that these ass assessments are standardized because even when teachers are using rubrics developed by test developers, teachers are not being calibrated with one another usually to make sure they're all doing the same thing when they score. Disco tests are quite different from both of these forms of assessment, though they are more similar to some formative assessments that exist today. The target constructs for disco tests, the target skills, are things like making connections, communicating, explaining, thinking, and learning. Quite different from conventional assessments and still different from many formative assessments. The targets are things like how students apply what they've learned to address primarily ill-structured problems, problems that actually don't have a single right or wrong answer. And the item types for our assessments are virtually all open response, with a very few um, exceptions we use for clarification. The answer quality instead of being right or wrong or better or worse, is more or less developed. So it's a very different way of thinking about quality of response. And the metric, or the main metric that we use, is the lectical scale, which is a developmental metric, and we're going to talk more about that in a minute. Uh, we also, though, incorporate teacher metrics. So we combine uh, an objective independent scale with teacher's use of rubrics in the classroom. The purpose of our assessments is very explicitly to support growth and also to make it possible to actually trace development over time. And these assessments, because they include both the objective lectical scale score or class score, the, the electronic version of the score, um, also include teacher rubrics. So they're both standardized and they're more subjective using these rubrics, um, which means that there's an unstandardized component as well. And we're doing this really intentionally because we want to, to benefit from what teachers have to say about students. We can actually make feedback for reports that's more precise given teachers' evaluation of students. But we also want teachers to be learning from us. So they're learning about development from us and we're learning about how they see student performances from them. To build DISCO tests, we use a methodology called developmental maiutics and a developmental ruler called the lectical scale. We also use an electronic scoring system called CLASS. And you can learn a lot more about the methods and the ruler at lecticalive.org or under the About tab on our YouTube channel. We are the only test developer whose assessments are based on a deep study of how the skills and knowledge targeted in an assessment develop over time. For the assessment I'll be showing you soon, we've traced and documented the development of targeted skills and concepts from kindergarten through adulthood. Right now, let's take a look at development on the lectical scale, a developmental scale based on the work of Harvard's Dr. Kurt Fisher. The lectical scale has 13 levels that cover the lifespan. We're going to be focusing on levels 5 through 12, which are the levels we work with most often here at Lectica. We'll begin with level 5, which is the level during which we learn to crawl, walk, 
feed ourselves and try to control aspects of our social world. For example, babies start to gesture near the end of this level with signals that mean things like, look there, I want that, and pick me up. A few words also emerge at this level, such as the names of familiar objects, animals, or people, as well as words for those gestures I just mentioned. After they've mastered the skills of level five, young children, usually at around age two, transition into level six. In this level, they learn a great deal about their physical and social worlds. They also learn the names of many things in their world, including the primary colors and basic feelings like happy, sad, and mad. By the end of level six, they can even describe what they're feeling or doing in short, often grammatically correct, sentences. Children usually move from level six into level seven, sometime between their third and fourth birthdays. During level seven, children achieve a number of advances in social understanding, like knowing the difference between truths and lies, or what it means to keep a secret. They also produce longer sentences and are able to use conjunctions like then, but, and because to connect ideas. Their understanding of numbers also grows. They can now do simple addition, with the help of fingers and toes. Most children transition into level eight in their seventh year. This is the level in which reading usually takes off and basic arithmetic really starts to make sense. It's also the level in which children begin to tell detailed stories about present, past, or anticipated events. Many of these are stories about social interactions, especially with best friends. By age nine, most children have made the transition into level nine. In this level, thinking undergoes a major change from what's called concrete thinking to abstract thinking. This shows up in how children talk about friendship. Rather than telling a story about how they feel after being lied to by a particular friend, as they would in level eight, children performing in level nine can sum up how they feel about lying in a general statement, like, it's not much fun to be friends with people who lie to you. In this level, children also build other ideas about the nature of friendship and begin to understand several other abstract concepts like facts, evidence, opinions, perspectives, and persuasion. By age 13, most teens have transitioned into level 10. In this level, they're able to build a reasonable understanding of many important science, mathematical, and social concepts and apply those concepts in real-world contexts. This is because they can now see logical relations between the kind of abstract ideas they began to develop in Level 9. For example, they're able to make a connection between being labeled as a liar and maintaining a good reputation, or between the motives of a researcher and the objectivity of her research. Unlike Levels 0 to 10, Level 11 does not emerge routinely in a particular age range. In fact, level 11 is not even the most common level in adulthood. That distinction belongs to level 10. But level 11 is catching up, partly because the complexity of adult life in the 21st century demands more than the ability to see logical relations between a few variables. With the exception of entry-level service or labor positions, most jobs today involve a lot of complexity. In level 11, people build the skills for coping with this complexity by gradually developing the ability to identify and work with systems of relations between multiple variables. By the way, a little bit of growth in level 11 goes a long way. For example, the difference between the skills needed in a typical mid-level management position and an upper-level position is only about one-fifth of a level. A few highly motivated and talented individuals with an intense love of learning continue to develop beyond level 11 and into level 12. Usually, development into level 12 requires building deep expertise in at least two knowledge areas. This is because the kind of ideas that emerge in level 12 result from connecting multiple bodies of knowledge. 
Darwin did it with his theory of natural selection, which integrated geology and biology. Einstein did it with the theory of relativity, which integrated mathematics and theoretical physics. And Steve Jobs did it with Apple by successfully integrating technology, design, and marketing. The time has come for our tour of a disco test. This slide shows a dilemma and a couple of questions from our Lectical Reflective Judgment Assessments, also known as the LRJA, our very first set of electronically scored assessments. The LRJA specifically targets skills for working with information, evidence, perspectives, and conflict. Each form features a dilemma with no correct answer, just like most of the situations we face in everyday life. Students are asked to make judgments and justify them. Once responses have been submitted, students are asked to rate their own work. We include self-assessments in every DISCO test because it's a practice that's been shown to support more effective learning and a habit of mind that's worth cultivating. Immediately after the self-assessment has been completed, our electronic scoring system class calculates a score and students are directed to their reports. In the reports, we describe how a given child is likely to be thinking based on their class score, then describe what comes next. The report also includes learning activities and resources that are designed specifically to engage and challenge children by targeting their growth edge or learning sweet spot, that Goldilocks zone we talked about. The learning activity shown here asks students to examine the relation between their responses and the descriptions of their current thinking and what comes next. Each report also includes at least one other learning activity that's laid out as a V-call, so students can begin to learn how to weave V-calls into their learning on their own. Once Lectica Live for Teachers launches in 2018, teachers will not only have immediate access to student reports, they'll be able to use the Lectica Live for Teachers scoreboard, a report designed especially for them. The first section of the scoreboard provides some basic information about the child's growth, describes an everyday practice that will support his or her development, and lists suggested resources that are likely to appeal to the child. And I have to say yes, Reading mystery stories does indeed help children hone their thinking skills. Teachers will also be able to trace each child's growth over time, compare performances at different test times, and if their school is a member of our network and the student has taken enough assessments, they'll be able to see the child's current predicted growth curve and even compare it with curves predicted at earlier test times. On the graph, the scale on the left is the lectical scale. In grades 4 through 12, levels 9 and 10 predominate. And teachers will also see how the student is doing relative to students in the same grade at other schools in our database. This gauge chart shows how one child's score compares to the average scores of other children in the same grade and in low, average, and high-performing schools. The feedback in DISCO test reports is designed to help teachers build targeted skills. To work most effectively with DISCO tests, teachers can benefit from training. But most teachers can begin right away to work with the suggestions and resources in reports. Let's say that you're a teacher and your class has just taken the LRJA. As noted earlier, every child in the class will have received instructions for thinking about what comes next. This activity is designed as a V-call. The goal is to help students understand their feedback. The information is in the students' responses and the how you think about evidence feedback. The activity is to respond to the questions in thinking about what comes next. And the reflection is in the final instruction to seek and reflect upon feedback. There are a number of ways to use this learning activity. For example, Students who receive the same feedback can work together in dyads or small groups to complete the entire activity. Or students can do the written work on their own, then come together afterward to compare notes and seek feedback. Like any written work done by students, students' responses to DISCO tests 
and their work on recommended activities can be graded. Knowing this can make it more comfortable for teachers who are new to DISCO tests to begin incorporating them in the classroom. We're just about to launch a campaign to create a subscription service called Lactic Alive for Parents, which makes it possible for parents to trace and support the development of their children's skills for thinking and learning. Check out Lactic Alive for Parents to learn more about the scoreboard. It's very similar to what we're building for teachers. And if you want to make sure your students' skills for thinking and learning are developing optimally, we can help. We begin by taking a baseline measure to determine your current level of success in building these skills. Then we can show your teachers how to use DISCO tests and vCall to support even more robust learning. Thank you for your interest in DISCO test. We invite you to visit Lectica Live for more information, to contact us, or to play with our free demo of the LRJA called the Class Demo.